Okay. Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on risk and opportunities and linkage to the business model. My name is Saskia Slomp. I'm working here at EFRAC. And before we start um, with the actual program, a few admin um, issues that I want to share with you. So this meeting is recorded and you can watch it also afterwards and you can listen it back uh, after the webinar when you want. What I also want to mention is that the slides, the bios and other information you can find on our website. So if you can't read it well or if you want more information, please go to our website to the date of the meeting and you find all documents. So we have, a, as you have seen, a very eminent panel of speakers and you can ask them questions. There is a box on your screen at the bottom and there you can type your questions in. So you can ask whatever question you want. You can address it to a person or we can address it for you to a person. So please use that uh, chat box to put your questions. Then in addition, we will use these uh, so-called polling questions. So the first polling question you will already get during the speech um, that you will hear soon of EFRAC Board President Jean-Paul Gousses. This question comes on your screen. You just have to fill it in and then you see the answers popping up. There will be uh, a couple of questions also during the panel discussion and we urge you to help us um, to get your views and it would be very welcome that we know what each of you are thinking. So if you can fill it in, please do so. Now, let me, uh, yes, I heard that Jean-Paul is there, so I'm going to introduce him now. Jean-Paul Gousses is EFRAC board president and he's also the chairman of the European Lab Steering Group and he is a former MEP. He has been nominated by the European Commission after consultation by the Parliament and the Member States. So Jean-Paul, I'm going to give the floor to you to say the introductory words for this webinar. Thanks, Saskia. Good afternoon to all of you. Warm welcome to all of you to this webinar on business model, sustainability, risk and opportunity supporting. We have over 500 people registered, which is really impressive. This webinar will reveal the main characteristics of the of a, a European lab project. This is stimulating innovation by identifying and sharing good practices. Bring me to the establishment of the European lab and the many developments in the, of the, since of EFRAC involved in sustainability reporting. The European Commission asked EFRAC in the 28th action plan, finance and sustainable growth to establish the European Corporate Reporting Lab with the aim I just mentioned, who now call it the European Lab. The European Lab had a Swiss part and its first project task force published already its report on climate-related reporting in the beginning of 2020. This report has been very well received. In parallel, we carried out an agenda consultation for the European Lab with our stakeholders. The project at Stored Ideas, since we not surprise you, is to the EU agenda. The project task force on non-financial risk and opportunities and the linkage to the business model was established in summer last year. Today, the project task force is preparing its final report and we are going to discuss the good practices examples identified as their case findings. As you know, more developments took place in 2020 after the oral announcement of Executive Vice President Dombrovskis in the beginning of the year. EFRAC received at the end of June two mandates of the European Commission. EFRAC was asked to undertake preparatory work on the collaboration of possible EU non-financial information standards. At the time, we were speaking about non-financial, but now we have all moved on to sustainability standards. This work was undertaken by the third project task force. I also received an unpersoned mandate to make proposals for a revised governance and finance structure of IFEFRAC 
were to become the standard setter. Both reports, with our final recommendations, were published in the beginning of March. Till April, it was all about possible standard and a lot of ifs. We have now moved on with the publication of the proposal for CSRT. The EU sustainability reporting standards are the core of the proposal. We were very much welcome that EFRAC is called open for the technical advice, thus for the development on the draft standards. You may have seen the letter EFRAC received from Commissioner McGuinness and published last week Monday. She asked EFRAC to start as soon as possible with the technical work and the governance reforms. This is, par is parallel with the legislative process. We are facing a very ambitious timeline for the first set of standard. June 2022 is tomorrow. But let me come back today. The work that we discussed today of the project task force on reporting on risk opportunities and the business model is very relevant also for the wider sustainability work. In preparing draft standard practice will be looked and at and good practices can point the way forward. Putting good practices in standards may be a step so far and put the barrier to height. Good practices should over help other companies to report their reporting, they can pick and learn. I want, take, I want to take this opportunity to thank Mario and Down, the co-chairs of the Project Task Force, but also all the members for the tremendous work they have already undertaken and will have to undertake further. With this big thanks, I am handing back to Saskia. Thank you, Jean-Paul. Thank you for these words and this information about the developments at EFRAC. Uh, I would like to join you uh, in your word of thanks uh, for the work undertaken by um, Mario, by Dawn, but also by all the project task force members and the work they're still going to undertake. Now, now we come to the next part of our project. So you will uh, come to our webinar today. You will get a presentation of good practice examples and key findings by the two co-chairs. So Mario Abela, he's Director Redefining Value at the WBCSD, and he's also Visiting Professor at the IESEG School of Management in Paris. And the other co-chair is Dawn Slevin. She is Managing Director of Else Europe, and she is involved in EuroCIF through their Irish member organization. And then we will enter into a panel discussion, which will be moderated by Dawn and Mario. And we have five eminent panel uh, panelists, speakers with very different backgrounds. So we have Julia Genuardi. She is head of sustainability planning and performance management at the NL Group. And she is a member of both the European Lab PTFs on climate-related reporting and on sustainability reporting standards. Then we have Philippe Grigor. He is head of the responsible company section at Frank Bolt, and he is a member of the European Lab Steering Group. Then Ron Gruyters, policy advisor sustainability at Umedian, and he is also a member of the Project Task Force on Sustainability Reporting Standards. Nadia Humphries works at Sustainable Finance Solutions at Bloomberg, and she is co-rapporteur on the European Commission's Platform for Sustainable Finance, subgroup five on data and usability, and she is former member of the Commission's TAG. Andre Jacobs, a senior advisor to the Board on Strategy and Sustainability at IBM EMRO, and he was a member of our Project Task Force on Climate-Related Reporting. So with this in short introduction, and if you want to uh, see more about them, um, please go to the bios that we have posted on our website. Uh, I'm handing now to Mario, who will start with the introduction of the findings and the um, good practice examples. Mario, over to you. Thanks, Saskia, and welcome everyone. Um, Dawn mm. and I are very excited to uh, have you uh, join us today. Uh, we're very much looking forward to your interaction. Uh, just to quickly run through the agenda, 
Um, we'll provide some context about the project, go through the key findings, uh, then we'll segue to a, a panel discussion and then finally wrap up. So in terms of um, what was the aim of this project, uh, it was very much to try and identify uh, what were the emerging good practices. Um, and with, uh, with that, we were required to um, make sure that we consulted a wide uh, group of users and took into account the different user views of what, um, what the expectations were in terms of reporting. And so um, because we were identifying good practice, as you'd expect, uh, there wasn't one company that was had the kind of perfect disclosure. Um, and so when we, when we went through dis the disclosures, we identified certain attributes uh, that really made some business model disclosures stand out um, against others. So in terms of um, the project scope, uh, focus on the business model and how opportunities and risks are linked to um, the business model if, if that connection is in fact made. Um, we noted that companies typically don't tag uh, risks as necessarily financial or, or non-financial. Um, and then in terms of uh, placement, uh, we found that um, the disclosures were uh, reported uh, across a number of reports. Um, so we looked at both the legal filings and other voluntary reports, such as sustainability reports. Uh, we took a multi-capital approach, and I think a lot of you would be familiar with uh, integrated reporting and the integrated reporting um, framework and the six capitals there, uh, the focus being that we're not just dealing with financial capitals, uh, those that are recognised on the um, on the balance sheet, but also um, non-financial capitals. And just on that point, I'd like to underscore the work that EFRAG is doing separately uh, on intangibles. And uh, as Jean-Paul said, um, you know, this work will also hopefully uh, build into the new standard setting arrangements um, in, in terms of disclosures around uh, the business model. And then in terms of um, drawing on existing re research, uh, we, we started as, um, we, we started with the Alliance of Corporate Transparency's uh, amazing piece of work where they looked at a thousand company reports. And uh, so we look to build on that work uh, rather than replicate uh, any of the things that have been already done. So in terms of um, key findings, uh, we weren't able to look at, and nor was it really our mandate, uh, to look at every single disclosure. So uh, given the, the time and resource constraints, uh, we looked at 65 companies. Uh, the, the, we did a, a stratified sample uh, so that it was um, as representative as it could be. We reviewed 43 uh, disclosures in detail. Um, and in the uh, final report, uh, we're expecting around uh, 30 examples of good practices from across 20 companies. Um, so that's the, the background. And then we also followed up uh, with a survey and also interviews. So again, just to um, underscore some of the good practices uh, we found. Uh, so this is uh, Neste, uh, oil and gas company from Finland. Uh, now, the reason we thought this disclosure was uh, particularly good was in the description, the very comprehensive description it contains of their business model, of the way that this company uh, creates value. So this is a, a really good example of a, a really comprehensive uh, business model description. Uh, another attribute we were looking at was uh, the extent to which the um, business model 
differentiated between short, medium and long term. And what Allianz has done here is they've picked up on transition scenarios uh, and given a sense of how the business is likely uh, to be impacted over those time periods. So you're getting you know, that kind of multi-dimensional perspective on short, medium uh, and long term. And then uh, DSM, uh, a Dutch um, chemical and nutrition company. Uh, here, this is a really good example of dependencies and impacts. So you can see um, the way they have structured their business model is to draw out the impacts on people, planet and profit, holding all three of those uh, t together um, and making it clear that their business uh, is about creating value across each of those three, uh, not, not a trade-off uh, against um, any of them. Now I'll hand over to uh, Dawn, who's um, going to, to speak about um, risks and opportunities. Over to you, Dawn. Thank you very much, Mario. And indeed, I'll continue the examples of very good practices that we've identified. And I start here with ENBW, an, an energy sector company. And key strengths of their reporting are they have an opportunity and risk map, including key areas of strategy, operations, financial and compliance. They disclose the structure and processes of the integrated opportunity and risk management system that they have developed. And detail is provided on top risks and opportunities, whilst they also acknowledge there are a wide variety of other um, risks and opportunities facing the group. Next slide, please. Thank you. ENBW linked top opportunities and risks with their key performance indicators. Um, and these were financial, strategic and non-financial, as you see here in the table. And they've also identified their direct and potential effects. And I may note also that the reporting is in grams of CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour for um, their energy uh, CO2 intensity associated with their electricity generation, which of course is an EU taxonomy metric. Um, EMBW consider impacts on engagement with a wide range of stakeholders, um, including procurement employees, contractors, um, and also their contractual relationships. And they've looked at a, a short-term, medium-term, and long-term timeline. And um, they present this in terms of our present and our future. Next slide, please. So now looking at um, AB Volvo, car manufacturing um, company. And the key strengths of their reporting are uh, they've conducted a comprehensive development of risks and opportunities um, across environmental and social factors. Um, the mitigation of risks and improvements in operations are viewed as opportunities and, and clearly stated as such. Um, an example of opportunities are in human rights, where they have identified an increased freedom of association, improved health and safety, improved working hours and vacation time, and also addressing discrimination in employment and, and developing security your grievance channels. And also, Volvo uh, conduct risk assessments of selected conflict areas and regional government end users of their products. And they train their employees to prevent use of their products or operations that have um, an adverse effect on, on human rights in those regions. And their reporting captures future opportunities and prepares for market changes that are on the horizon, such as a rapid development of emerging technologies and new market landscape. And examples of what they've considered as opportunities in this emerging landscape is electrification of vehicles, digitalization of vehicles, more efficient uh, industrial systems, and phase out of fossil fuels. And indeed, they do provide some case studies of their transfer of their energy source from fossil fuels to renewable energy at their key production sites globally. Um, so there is some interesting information there. Um, NL, next slide, please. Again, another um, energy provider, 
um, they have provided really good clarity around the risks and opportunities and the relationships. Um, they see opportunities in the transition, um, energy transition, and uh, decarbonisation um, is, as example, viewed as an opportunity. Um, and they have conducted a stakeholder-driven risk and opportunity mapping. And um, they give a, a, quite a, a bit of consideration to um, their opportunities and sharing the benefits of those with the wider communities. And um, they accompany their analysis with wide-scale measures that support climate related energy, environment, industrial and social aspects. So it's quite a comprehensive stakeholder review there. Um, they also consider macroeconomic aspects. Um, the EU's New Green Deal is viewed as an opportunity for accelerating towards a decarbonised economy. And interestingly, NL are an example of using the TCFD framework to explicitly represent the main relationships between scenario variables and types of risks. And they specify strategic and operational approaches to managing risks, risks through mitigation and adaptation measures. And all in all, there's a good linkage between risks and opportunities in their approach. And again, they also have a timeline, um, short term being one to three year, medium to 2030 and long term to 2050. And they also use um, EU taxonomy related metrics, which we would support. Um, so what are our key findings? Next slide, please. So we've considered our key findings into five general areas, and these are the business model, the risks and opportunities, um, the performance and viability of the company, its presentation and its credibility. So if you can go back, please, Mario, uh, I'll just go through some of these key findings. Um, so in the business model, there are front runners in the space. However, even leaders don't show a high level of sophistication in all aspects of reporting. The value creating, creation aspects um, remain in early development, um, but there is em emergent value creation reporting that we've found. Um, and also destruction of value is not adequately demonstrated and opportunities could be addressed in view of avoidance of value destruction. And this would help in, uh, with regard to relating opportunities um, with direct and indirect impacts of the companies. So there's, there's quite a bit of more work on the business model that's, that's needed. On risks and opportunities, uh, sustainability-related risks are disclosed in various places of corporate reporting, and they tend to lack coherence. Um, current practices lack a structured approach where risks are clearly linked to the business model, um, and companies rarely explain if and how their business model and strategy are, are for example, resilient to climate risk. Sustainability-related opportunities are generally disclosed as part of material themes and, and poorly developed um, and often not connected, if at all, to the business model. Um, and value of non-disclosure, um, non-financial risks and opportunities is in most cases not disclosed. And this might be a monetary value or an intangible value to, to the company. Performance and viability, we see poor development, as I said, of sustainability-related opportunities compared to risks. And this suggests that they're seen as a restraint on the business rather than an opportunity of growth. So this would need to be addressed. Um, and the business model is not holistically developed. It in itself lacks sufficient information to allow for linkage to risks and opportunities, particularly over relevant timelines, short, medium, long term. And this is necessary for users to assess uh, the business's long-term viability. And then in terms of presentation, you know, what is the general tone and content of the report and, and its key features? Disclosures are mainly positive. Um, more balance could be brought through um, by also disclosing the negative impacts, and this speaks to the materiality aspects of reporting. Um, again, poor linkage. Um, is, is endemic and inconsistent use of standards, guidance and framework was observed and also um, a difficulty in that there is variation in use of terms and definitions and this is an issue for preparers and users alike. Um, and then a, a poor development of intangible related risks and opportunities is seen. Next slide, please. On credibility, we're finding that there's um, not enough use of science-based targets. And I gave some examples of the EU taxonomy. Indeed, as a former technical expert group member of the taxonomy, 
one thing I do when I'm looking through reports is firstly to look at the metrics and are these science-based um, uh, credible uh, um, disclosures uh, of their progress across cert certain environmental um, objectives. And we see not enough of this. Um, there's also inconsistent use of assurance necessary to help ensure that corporate reporting system value chain is reliable, is factual and in line with the science-based targets and implemented according to the relevant principles. And finally, and significantly, there is a lack of understanding and insufficient deployment of technology, which has the potential to play a very significant role in minimising reporting burden on, on, on human resources, but also um, to ensure that the data collection is robust and data verification is carried out consistently. Next slide, please. So in, in coming to our findings, we were guided by key financial and non-financial reporting principles, such as from the IASB, its conceptual framework for financial reporting, where it speaks about relevance and faithful representation in reporting, and also the PTF non-financial reporting standards proposes the pre-work that was completed. Um, for enhancing the qualitative characteristics of financial and non-financial frameworks. And this speaks to comparability, verifiability, uh, timeliness, and, ver and um, uh, also under the understandability of the information. Um, we, um, our task force has also incorporated additional sustainability-related characteristics um, derived from non-financial reporting, and, and these include a coherence, um, timelines, the connectivity between risks, opportunities, and the business model, stakeholder inclusiveness. Again, I've spoken to some of the examples where we saw this as a very strong point in reporting, and also strategic focus and future orientation. So again, looking into that future market conditions and environmental and planetary and social conditions that influence companies' choices. Next slide, please. And finally, to say a few words on use of technology, we conducted an in-depth analysis of the reports um, and we looked for evidence of application of technological solutions to disclosures across the entire disclosure journey of preparation, distribution and consumption. And we inferred from the reporting whether and to what extent companies were using technology and, and if so, what technologies were they using. And overall, we found there's limited evidence in corporate disclosures um, that technology is being applied. And when it is, it's somewhat patchy um, and in an ad hoc manner. And this calls for additional um, disclosure and transparency on the methodologies. And there are many methodologies that we considered, including um, satellite imagery for data collection and risk man management, blockchain and tracking of supply chain data, um, the use of data management systems systems, as well as natural language processing and natural language generation um, for interrogating data as well as for uh, preparing it. And there are some interesting findings in our report on that. And um, if I could go to the next slide. Uh, Dawn, do you want me to just let you catch your breath? <laughs> um, so on the path to improvement, so, um, you know, Dawn's outlined to you uh, our main findings, and I guess to an extent, um, they probably won't come as a major surprise to anyone. Uh, that's the reason why the um, other PTF, the NFRS, um, has recommended uh, the development of standards really to pr provide the detail that's needed. Um, so in terms of improvement, clearer description of the business model and really importantly to make sure it's linked to risks and opportunities. So not only understanding how value is created, but what are the risks and opportunities related to that business model. Um, more emphasis on opportunities. So uh, sustainability can be a, a great engine for growth as well as um, you know, minimising harm. So changing the psychology there. Um, better connectivity between financial and non-financial. So if there's a discussion of climate change, um, is, is it clear in the financials that, um, you know, the impairment reviews have taken into account, um, you know, the impact of climate 
optimising the use of technologies. Uh, and there's, as Dawn said, there are a lot of those available. And then finally, credibility uh, through third party independent assurance, which uh, is a feature of the proposed um, CSRD, uh, which calls for limited assurance uh, of, of all these uh, reports or of the management report. Uh, Dawn, did you want to add anything on the on the improvements or should we move ahead? No, please move on. Thank you, Mario. So I think now we're going to the panel. Uh, so I'll stop sharing my screen. So we see some great questions coming in. So we, what we'll do is we'll get the presentations uh, from the panel and then maybe address the, the questions. Saskia, did you um, want to introduce the panel or should we just move straight in? I think I introduced them already, uh, Mario, okay. very briefly. Okay. Of course, not to steal too much of the time, but I think okay. they, uh, they're quite well known to the public that uh, that we have. and. For those that don't know them, please go to the website and you find the photos and the bio and you will recognize them all. Thanks, Askia. Okay, so um, I'll hand over to uh, the panel now. So, um, Mario, we're going to start on the business model uh, reporting. So, uh, I, I think uh, on what we heard, uh, Philippe will start to um, to speak and to give his view on what are the findings and perhaps also on the examples that we put forward to you. Thanks, Saskia. I've had so many screens opened. Um... So, sh shall I kick it up? Hello, this is Philippe speaking. Yes, please. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, um, well, thank you for this and thank you for the opportunity to, to provide comments. It's, uh, the work that you're doing is, is very much needed and very challenging. And uh, I'm glad that the work of the Alliance for Corporate Transparency provided hopefully a useful starting point. For, for those who don't know, the Alliance is an initiative of 20 leading organizations active at the EU level. It brings together a number of NGOs as well as the likes of CDP, CDSB, the shift uh, um, and so on. And we've carried out an analysis of 1,000 European companies for some to the financial reporting directive. And we've looked at 500 questions based on the GRI, SAS, BTC, and so on and so forth. There's of course a ridiculous level of detail, but it shows the complexity of the, <laughs> let's say, uh, landscape of reporting uh, reporting initiatives. So um, the, the bottom line is that uh, it's very, very difficult to come up with an objective criteria for how business model uh, and strategic reporting should look like. It's this one thing. And the, the, the other thing is that our main finding was quite paradoxical and I think very, very much aligned with yours. And that's on one hand, there is not a coherent practice. And on the other hand, the, the, uh, the disclosures in this area has almost a boilerplate quality. It seems like you know, we can put these things together, but obviously, but but uh, that's simply a uh, reality. There's a lots of focus on compliance and commitments when uh, disclosing the business model, and much less focus on a dynamic perspective of business model and strategy vis-a-vis -vis risks and opportunities. And that's that's really where uh, what we need to look at. In terms of numbers, uh, we identified about 10 to 20 percent of companies providing some interesting examples of good practice. Uh, but uh, let's say the most striking finding was that less than half of companies provided some, let's say, basic integrity between the topics they address as part of the business model description and those that are actually addressed in in the uh, in the thematic parts of the of the report. So it's, it's really difficult to understand this kind this kind of a disconnect. Uh, another another point is that there is a minority of companies who provide um, a good description of the maturity issues from the perspective of why they were selected, what are the reasons, what are the criteria, why the company considered, considered the issues. 
they cover to be, uh, to be material. So it's about 10 to 20%. And similarly, I mean, every 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 single of your findings is is reflected in a, in a, in a, in our work, including on opportunities, uh, let's say uh, the lack of reporting on strategic targets, and so on and so forth. I think that this shows this this shows, let's say, two conclusions, or this leads to two two conclusions. The first is that companies really really need clarity, and this is where the the FRX work on European reporting standards can be can be of great help. And secondly. It's, this is, a, I have to say, unclear reporting or disclosures is a, is a symptom of a bigger problem, which is that companies are not really clear how to engage with sustainability at a strategic level, which is, uh, let's say, worrying in the context of this massive climate transition process, which is, uh, which is, which is uh, starting in, in, uh, in Europe. And uh, if I may add one or two notes on the, on the examples that, uh, that uh, you have identified. Um, I think it is important to ask what information is really needed and can be reasonably conveyed in this way. And I, I believe that, that there, are, there are two information in this regard. One is that one is the uh, I would call two sets of information. One is the, the, the clear description of material topics the company finds important and explanation why and of the criteria applied. And this is where the stakeholder perspectives within and so on and so forth. And the second perspective is that on strategic objectives, which are relevant for the business model development, this kind of dynamic perspective. Um, and so in, in many, uh, many of the examples, including, including yours, I mean, uh, there's lots of the information is provided in a very general, general way, which doesn't really, you know, helps readers to understand what, uh, what's behind it. But for example, the, uh, the, the example of Allianz shows uh, really good directions in terms of focus on the strategic targets over multiple time horizons and linked to a very particular problem of climate transition. So this is, this is, this is actually, uh, we, this is what we found to be the most valuable part of companies' strategic and business model description. So, uh, whereas, you know, the general, let's say, overviews of, uh, of maturity of uh, maturity topics and uh, companies compliance policies and so on and so forth it's, it's not really it's not really a good use of the of the space for business model description at least that's that was our finding right so so much congratulations again it's an impressive piece of work thanks so much philip um julia can we turn to you now as a as a preparer and someone who's um, having to wrestle with all these requirements and, and satisfy them. Um, could you please make your intervention, please? Yes, thanks. Thanks, first of all, for your uh, your invitation and especially to consider NL as a best practice in this kind of work. Uh, I think that it's, uh, it's a great work because uh, um, we know that we are in a moment of alphabetical soup and regulation soup cases. So I think that the identification of good practice uh, is absolutely fundamental to disseminate best practice in the rest of, uh, of the sustainability landscape, because I don't think that in this moment uh, we have to reinvent the wheel uh, in terms of uh, many, many different new approach, but we have to focus the attention on some specific cases and probably uh, good practices that you correct and identify uh, can help uh, all the business world to uh, identify a single process to do that. Because uh, it's uh, absolutely a global movement that involve all the actors uh, in, in the world. But we have always to remember that the data source uh, is absolutely the business world. And so it it's, uh, it's really important that we have clear rules, clear good practice, and we start to work in the, in the same line. I totally agree with the description of Philip also, uh, because I think that uh, um, normally uh, we have a big mistake uh, because the company start uh, to comply something, not to describe the sustainable business model. And if we don't start with the value chain and in the business model, sometimes it's a little bit difficult to identify the correct risk and the correct opportunities. And uh, we will maintain a qualitative and narrative description uh, because we don't start uh, with the correct starting point, in my personal opinion. So uh, I think that uh, qualitative information and quantitative information, if it's used in a correct way, 
have the same importance in uh, in the reporting but we have to link quantitative information to business model and normally the quantitative information for the business model are exactly the targets that we define and this kind of target it's necessary that are measurable in terms of progress and uh, we have to be transparent in the progress of this kind of target using the standard that we have uh, and it's exactly the respect of the sorry if i use the principle of GRI, but at this moment is the only one that we have in terms of balance. But I think that if you report uh, a correct uh, sustainability report or integrated report to what we want, we have to guarantee this kind of principle of balance. So we have to report in positive and also in negative or uh, if we have some areas for improvement. So I think that the starting point is exactly the business point, the business model, sorry, and we have to link all the activities that we have to the business model because the reporting really is a progress of the sustainability plan over the strategic plan. So thank you again for your work because uh, I repeat, sorry, I totally uh, convince that in this moment we need some good practice. We need to be aligned because also the SMEs are the supply chain or the big companies, and the bank need to see need to see a, a unique, a single word of data that they have to use. But the business world have to work all together to guarantee that the bank and the investors can use data that are coherent, that are comparable. So again, thank you. And the role of guidance is really, really important in this kind of, uh, of, uh, of meaning. So thank you. Thanks so much, Julia. And that is incredibly um, helpful. I think you really underscored the point that um, in the absence of any you know, clear guidance, uh, companies like yours have had to uh, draw on various frameworks to make sense um, of, of the requirements under the existing directive. Um, over to uh, Ron to provide a, an investor's perspective. Thank you, Mario. And uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to uh, reflect on the draft findings of the task force work uh, today. And congratulations on the work so far, and I'm looking forward to, uh, to the final report. Um, as Umedian, uh, we are an organization of institutional investors um, aiming to promote corporate governance practices and sustainability performance of listed companies in the Netherlands. And corporate sustainability reporting is at the heart of this mission. Um, indeed, more specifically, uh, how companies have made or are making their business model resilient in the light of the rapidly changing context and um, the immense challenges and opportunities lying ahead. Now, of course, in essence, this is nothing new, right? This is at the core of what long-term investors do. Um, what is more novel, however, is of course the increased and very focused attention on the impact of material sustainability matters. Now, from the investor perspective, I would have to uh, emphasize that the preliminary findings uh, presented today of the, uh, the task force um, really confirm what we also see. There's absolutely um, still much more room for further development of uh, reporting practices. So yes, we, we also regularly find quite unbalanced presentations of how sustainability matters affect the business. Uh, there's ample attention for things that go well or that have proved successful or at least appear this way, right? Um, there's less attention for how remaining uh, key issues are going to be addressed and how they are expect expected to uh, affect a company. But we also have to admit that we have already come a long way. So we see a sharp uptake and a very serious attempts uh, of reporting on value creation, uh, on, for example, the recommendations of the TCFD, uh, which also includes scenario analysis of uh, the long-term impact of climate change and, and the company's response. And um, we should not forget that this change is taking place in a very complex ecosystem of all kinds of drivers. And they can be, uh, on the one hand, internal for companies. On the other hand, they can be external, such as economic, social, and uh, drivers such as government policies and regulations. And there is not yet one way for companies to do it right. right? There's a multitude of, of options out there. Um, so more reporting and more pioneering by companies leads to more transparency, better accountability, and stronger dialogue between the company on the one hand and its stakeholders 
uh, on the other. And so as often is being said, it is a journey. Now, to wrap up from an investor point of view, um, reporting is one of the means of a company's um, accountability. Um, and for that to really improve, uh, to be more focused, more is indeed needed, as also show the, uh, the preliminary findings of the report. So I can basically only echo what, is, what has already been said. I think, first of all, um, there is a need for a strong report and framework and standards um, that promote a balanced and a faithful uh, representation. Um, second, uh, we would really like to see a harmonization of reporting frameworks and preferably and ultimately uh, globally. Um, and third, uh, but not least, uh, adequate assurance of, uh, of this key information. So let me pause uh, there. Back to you, uh, Mario. Uh, thanks, Ron. And um, I think some very helpful insights there in terms of what, what investors are looking for. Um, over to, to Nadia, just trying to kind of manage the time. Um, Nadia, if you could give us a perspective um, from, from Bloomberg in terms of as a major um, data aggregator and someone who uh, is trying to make sense of all this information, um, if you, you could please give us your perspective. Yes, Mario, thank you um, equally for, for the opportunity to comment here. And, and as the panellists have said, congratulations on the work so far. I think a lot of what I will say is going to echo what you've already presented. Um, to set the scene, so from a Bloomberg perspective, uh, we collect data from about 12,000 international companies, typically large cap, so those with greater than 100 million US dollar equivalent market cap. Um, and I would say that our observation is data is shaped in three primary ways. So one is data self-reported by the company. Um, the other is looking at third party derived data. So ultimately what others say about the performance of that company. Um, and then the third is opinion based. So how that company compares relative to its peers. Um, as Ron mentioned, we've come a, lot, a long way and, and our focus, as is the topic today, on, on self-reporting. Uh, so what do we see as a state of disclosure today? And ultimately, if you think about it from an investor's perspective, you kind of want to funnel your data through. So you want to take sort of meaningful metrics to be able to shortlist a number of securities to look at, which means a lot of this beautiful narrative might be lost because you're going to immediately go to the data place and you're only going to start to look at the narrative once you've shortlisted companies. So I think that for any preparers listening today, they need to be aware of. Um, what we see right now, the state of play, um, yes, it's incomplete. Yes, it's inconsistent. Uh, it varies quite wildly, in fact, across jurisdictions, uh, company sizes and between sectors. Um, we also see an eagerness of companies to report to satisfy certain frameworks. Uh, what that has translated to in the real world are sometimes there are multiple sustainability reports produced by companies because they want to honour these different frameworks. Um, as you've mentioned, we absolutely see a, a weak link between financials and sustainability reports. Um, one place we see weakest is actually in the time of delivery of the report. So there's often a very significant time lag between the production of the financial statement of the firm and the ESG content. Um, we also see, for example, the location and naming of the sustainability reports can vary year on year. Um, we also see difference between holding level and consolidated level reporting. Uh, we see that certain subsidiaries of a company are included one year, but not included in another year. Um, and very frequently what we do see, and I think you touched upon this, is sustainability reports acting as PR tools for their company. Um, and quite a heavy mix of narrative and metric based data, but the quantitative information is limited and, if we're honest, really consistent. Um, so I know I've painted quite a bleak picture in terms of what we do see, but I would also say there is change. Um, and I think Ron mentioned this a little earlier as well. So TCFD, we see very strong adoption. So nearly 80 countries with over 2000 supporters, about half of which are financial firms, which ultimately will place uh, a request upon their investee companies to start to provide them the information for them to complete their own disclosures. Um, so there is willingness, as Dawn mentioned, 
obviously, we're starting to see the EU taxonomy take shape in the way that companies are considering how they are substantially contributing to climate change mitigation or adaptation, starting to think about significant harm around other environmental objectives. Um, so I think it, it's really important to state that, that out now. Um, in terms of what we want, uh, I will start with the simples, actually. So what would we benefit from? Uh, data being reported and stored in an accessible format would be great. Um, I think this was mentioned before, but certainly data that is certified in some way. Um, in an ideal world, it would be very close to, if not in, the annual account subject to board level sign off. Um, and I think it's important that we also start to consider the adequacy of those assurances um, and whether it's OK initially to have internal assurances rather than always forcing additional cost on external. Uh, I'll stop for there because I know we're going to have more things to, to touch on later, uh, but those are my, my main findings. Thanks. Thanks, Nadia. Um, a very long laundry list there of um, areas of improvement, but um, some excellent places, I think, for, for companies to start in terms of um, how they can address their current disclosures. Uh, over to um, Andre now from ABN AMRO to give us a financial institution perspective. Oh, thank you, Mario. Uh, well, I hope I can uh, give you that. Um, well, being an organization advisor by background, I only work for 10 years now for a bank, which is quite short for uh, uh, the perspective of bankers. Um, my, the only idea is one business model doesn't, isn't uh, uh, the same as the other one. Um, what I mean to say with this is um, when, I first, when I first wanted to report our business model for ABN AMRO, that's about 2013, there were so many discussions internally, well, we decided not to do it that year. Um, the next year we went to a framework, which was then VRI, and we reported the business model. And now, well, we still had the same uh, amount of discussions, so then we had the, the framework as a as a background. So this this is the, the way the business model should look like because we used VRI. Then we went to IRC uh, because we wanted to incorporate non-sustainable uh, topics into our analysis to make it more um, understandable uh, for our colleagues within the bank. And gradually, um, you see bankers starting to, well, ABNMO bankers, but also other Dutch bankers, that were more, more or less in the same uh, path, um, understanding the value of reporting on your business model and also the value, the information provided by a business model. Um, I heard uh, some comments about comparability. Well, I think there you have a very relevant topic. Um, as there are many frameworks, and there are also many different ways of visualization of business models, reporting on business models. Um, so if you really look into it, and you really look, for instance, to in KPIs that are mentioned, KPIs that are used by companies. Um, it looks that, like they have KPIs, but basically they most of the time only have data. And then you need KPIs to steer, but, but you also have KPIs to report. And those are quite often not the same. So can you look at it from a banking perspective? Um, uh, we recently had a change of in, in strategy, so we more or less stepped away from uh, uh, um, uh, big companies which are not in the northwest of Europe, uh, which made it much much easier uh, for Ebon and Mollet, more clear focus. But this was also because um, when looking at when really looking into the business model of other other companies, either reported or told or anyhow, it's really very difficult. You know, when you want to have a long-term value creation instead of the short-term, what um, financial institutions normally have, not because they want to, because when you loan money to a company, um, normally this loan has a trajectory or a time span of two to maybe five years. So most of the time, I mean, in previous years, um, 
the risk related to these sustainable topics, well, they weren't into effect in this short term that loan was taking place. So the effect was, in their opinion, very little. So they still gave the loan or they didn't. And now when you're looking for long-term value creation, and you need this business model, you see, I also see it my colleagues, and I'll see that at other banks uh, in the Netherlands, especially, but also other banks in, in, in Europe, that um, this give a change of thinking about companies, but also <laughs> they get a little bit, um, well, puzzled sometimes, I see. And you know, when, um, when you want to decide about the company, do we give this, the, give this as, uh, some money, basically, or for doing uh, relevant stuff? Why should I decide on? You know, uh, a couple of years ago, it was, for a banker, it was quite easy. I mean, I'm not a banker by origin. I'm a chemist. Uh, but, but, but bankers, you know, it was very clear. You had the financial uh, the decision making, financial risks, and it was within boundaries. You could decide to do it, and it was not within the boundaries. You couldn't decide to do it, so it was a no. And weighing these non-financial risks, I think we can come up to there later, with financial risks and whether it's in the reporting or not, it's very tough because like uh, also has been said, um, I mean, and with ABN Emma, we had the same discussions in our reporting over the last year. Uh, the report can't get too big. You know, it, must, it still must be understandable. So you don't report too much uh, in written terms. You want to have it visualized in an, a business model according to a framework, but then you still lose information. And um, this lost information is sometimes the most relevant one, I think, from a sustainable perspective. And what you see with the different frameworks coming up, um, gradually some of the risks pop up, but not always. So I think comparability is very difficult still. So I'm yes, I'm into make it make it one, make one um, usable framework. And I see still the data to be used, as Nadia always said, um, when you want to finance a company or not, um, it changes, but it changes slowly. Um, and it differs highly from whether it's a bank or a pension fund or whatever, because pension funds have a very long-term perspective and banks most of the time have more of a medium to short-term perspective. That's it. Thanks, Andre. Um, a lot of food for thought. And I think um, just in just to summarize, um, if I can summarize the, the preparers um, perspective. So uh, Julia and Andre, the uh, lack of clear requirements and, um, you know, this isn't, it isn't straightforward there. There's one thing to uh, describe your business model. So there's what your business model actually is. And then how do you depict that in the form, you know, in a report disclosure? These are all challenges and there aren't clear guidance. Julia talked about, um, you know, using GRI as a basis to, um, uh, you know, focus on balance, making sure that both the, the positives and the negatives are, are there. And then we heard um, from Ron and uh from Nadia in terms of um, really trying to, uh, for investors, trying to make sense of this. And um, I had here from Ron, uh, you know, that it's not one size that fits all. And I think a number of people have um, explained that. So um, a cookie cutter approach to a business model disclosure isn't going to work because they're all slightly different, but we do need some standardization. Um, we do need, uh, as Nadia was uh, pointing out, um, you know, we need some real basic things like, you know, the same formats and making sure that um, investors and those using information can actually um, digest that information, compare it, uh, be able to manipulate it. Um, and that's very difficult when 
Um, it's just uh, discursive narrative information, you know, without any numbers, without ev any evidence. Um, and that, that was a point I think you made as well, Ron, in terms of assurance and the importance of assurance. Um, and assurance being um, really the, the kind of ste second step um, after the company has provided evidence to support all the claims that they're making. Um, because assurance, as we know, isn't a kind of magic wand. Um, if the information isn't good, then um, assurance isn't necessarily going to um, uh, make it better. And then um, I think just to, to wrap up in terms of some of the, the challenges that, um, you know, Andre was, was pointing to there um, in terms of the time span, the mismatch between uh, the period over which you create value and the time horizon over which sustainability risks are likely to, um, to manifest. And again, you know, the business model is a model. So it's not the, the detail and you can't, within the bounds of a, of re, of a report, it's not possible to uh, go into massive length um, about every aspect of your, your company's value creation. So I'm just going to respond to some of the questions as well, um, kind of in summary, because we've had some really um, thoughtful questions coming in. Uh, and apologies if we don't get to all of these questions. Um, but um, one question was around uh, the academic literature and, you know, have we, have we looked at that? Um, we have, well, we did uh, at the very beginning. It didn't help us uh, terribly much in terms of um, trying to understand how to judge um, the quality of what was being disclosed. And that's where we, we developed the practical framework, uh, drawing on those qualitative characteristics of uh, financial and non-financial uh, information. But that academic literature uh, in terms of, you know, the business model canvas and, and other things in the literature, the components of business models, all of that is very useful information for um, companies, I think, to think through, well, what is our business model? Uh, and the business model canvas, um, you know, is a, is a great tool in, in doing that. Um, and in terms of where did we look, uh, we looked uh, basically everywhere we could find um, the business model. So um, I think as Philip said uh, at the start, you know, it was quite challenging to actually locate um, the business model because uh, it could be in the financial filing, in the management report, uh, whatever the national equivalent is. Uh, it could be in the sustainability report. It could be an integrated report. Sometimes they're different. So what's in each of those reports isn't necessarily identical. So um, you can see from the perspective of someone like Nadia that's trying to consolidate and make sense of all this information, uh, how it can be enormously challenging uh, to, to try and make sense and distill all of this. So um, hopefully we've answered uh, some of the questions you've, you've raised there. We did look at um, just on the point about geography and where the information was located. Um, I think the question's also getting at the point of, but what about other information that may have um, been kind of useful in understanding the business model? And I, you know, there's a lot of disclosures in the management report that in combination help you understand uh, the business model. But uh, really for the purposes of this exercise, we did focus very much on the business model uh, disclosures and the risk and opportunity disclosures, rather than take the, the management report in its um, totality. I think on that point, and just kind of monitoring the time, um, we've had uh, the um, poll questions, and just to report back, um, so the question, the current business model reporting uh, sufficiently informs on company sustainability risks and opportunities. And um, 
if I can uh, see this properly, about 41% partially agree, 33% uh, or 34% uh, disagree, 17% um, strongly disagree. So if we take there's only 2.4% that say, yes, absolutely agree, it does that. Um, so that's that's very interesting. I think um, we have a lot more people on the line than are actually responding to these, um, to these polling questions. So, um, you know, it's probably not totally indicative of, of everyone that's in the crowd, but uh, it'll give you some sense. And then on the... I'm just trying to go to the next question. Do you expect additional guidance um, to improve business model disclosure? And the overwhelming response here is yes, that it's the lack of guidance that really is getting in the way of the sort of quality disclosures um, people like Ron and, and Nadia uh, are talking about. Um, and that's because, you know, companies like NL and AB and AMRO have had to kind of invent this for themselves, drawing on the various strands um, in the reporting frameworks. Um, Dawn, I'll hand over to you now just because I'm very conscious of time and um, I want to make sure you have enough time um, for your questions as well. So over to you, Dawn. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mario. And thank you to all of our panelists and indeed to our audience. Um, we've received quite a number of interesting questions and we'll try and address these through the conversation um, as we go. Um, so first of all, if I can refocus your minds back on the topics on risks and opportunities before we launch into our, our discussion. And just to summarize some of the key findings in the five areas that I mentioned earlier. And what we're finding is um, risks are disclosed in various places. There's generally a lack of coherence um, in, in that sense. And there's also a lack of structured approach where risks are clearly linked to the business model. And this can also be said of opportunities, but additionally, um, opportunities tend to be theme-based and less well-developed than risks um, where they are. And the value of sustainability risks and opportunities is rarely, if ever, disclosed. And, and overall, as you've just discussed, um, this is all feeds from uh, a lack of holistic development of the business model and lack of clear linkage between these key facets of reporting. Um, and again, I highlighted some examples, and we're very fortunate to have some of our speakers from those company examples, the ABN AMRO and NL um, here. And I will now just launch into some of our questions to get more feedback from you around risks and opportunities. Um, firstly, what is your overall reaction to our findings around risks and opportunities? And Julia, if I could start with you there, if you have any um, suggestions or insights that you'd like to share. Yes, yes, thank you. So I, I'm in line with the, with your suggestion and with your finding. So I think that uh, the, the point is always the same. So it's absolutely necessary to have a systematic view of the sustainability information and the business model. So the business model is really the starting point. So before to report and before to define the, the plan, the strategic plan and the sustainability plan too, uh, that uh, I repeat are interconnected because the starting point is the strategic plan and the sustainability plan give other elements uh, to support uh, the reaching uh, of the main target of the company. Uh, but uh, the main phases and the previous phases are absolutely, first of all, the analysis of the ESG contest. Second one is the analysis of risk and the opportunities. And third one is absolutely the maturity analysis. These three elements are fundamental to define a strategic plan and the sustainability plan. So risk and the opportunities are fundamentally input to the definition of the strategic plan and the reporting. So um, I think that that this is exactly the interconnection. Uh, second one, I think that if you prepare correctly and analyze correctly ESG contest, uh, risk and opportunities and maturity analysis, you have to involve all the stakeholders that you have inside your company and that they live or work around your company. So you have different moments to involve the stakeholders. 
but I think always that it's not a, a task of sustainability department involves stakeholder. Sustainability department can support in the definition of the guidance to the stakeholder engagement, but you have to put in value all the stakeholder engagement activities uh, in the different sectors of the company because they know very well the stakeholder. And so you have to use the same methodology. You have to use the same uh, database to collect this information, but it's important that it's a spread process. So in this way, you can really involve all the categories of stakeholder in the different Thank you very much, Julia. That's really interesting. And indeed, we did have a question on um, NL's particular um, engagement with stakeholders, and you've provided some very insightful information there. Um, and I'm interested in, in your points generally um, amongst you on this. Overall, just to briefly get your reaction, um, Ron, I'll, I'll just go to you very quickly on the risks and opportunities findings as we've outlined them. Does it, is it in agreement with what your experience is? Thank you, Don. Yes, absolutely. So here too, from the institutional investor perspective, we absolutely recognize the preliminary findings of the, uh, the task force. So in our view here too, companies seem to be struggling with how to better specify their more uh, generally more qualitative description of how risks and opportunities affect uh, and help shape their strategy and, and their business. Um, and they struggle to be a bit more specific when it comes to forward-looking elements. So let me give an example. Um, so on the one hand, on the risk side, so we, we often come across reporting on what you would call the classic issues that were well established already before uh, the focus on ESG increased, right? So which would be now considered ESG. So in terms of, for example, social factors, personnel, um, uh, companies underline often the importance of um, 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 diversity as a uh, key success factor. Diversity in all these aspects, so not just gender-related uh, diversity. But if you then look for more detailed reporting on, um, on how exactly this takes shape, it is often limited to the very concrete risks of not being able to um, um, retain or attract key personnel, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so how can you, on the one hand, list um, personnel diversity as a crucial factor to a business success on the one hand, but not report very specifically on how then this is considered a risk if not, you know, if not met? Um, what is the nature then exactly of that impact and, and how is a company going about managing um, um, this risk? Um, so these are uh, recurring uh, topics in our engagement dialogues with companies. And then maybe uh, as an example uh, in the area of opportunities, um, very often it also does not really extend beyond what is actually very obvious, right? So for example, uh, and I'm now not specifically addressing Andre here, but regarding climate, we see, for example, banks reporting on opportunities of financing home improvements um, um, for more energy efficiency uh, um, of the uh, of the house on the mortgage, right? So um, that's considered an opportunity. Or we see companies reporting on possibilities of geo exploring for offshore solar parks, the opportunity, and scaling down their activities in the area of oil and gas exploring, which is a risk. Um, this is all. Um, um, fairly obvious, I would say, and what I think we can see there is that they usually follow um, very in-your-face trends rather than being the result of a systemic, uh, systematic assessment of what are the risks and opportunities for the various ESG themes that can be considered material for a specific business. Um, so I think to conclude, um, the amount of companies that actually try to very actively draw up plans for a sustainable business, forward-looking, not just responding to trends, but maybe trying to set a trend, be proactive about it, those are quite, those examples are quite limited. Um, so companies that that, that are also um, brave enough to make radical choices, that, that is quite limited. And I think obvious examples include, already mentioned DSM, um, uh, or for example, Unilever uh, in the area of sustainable products. Um, 
but these are always the examples that are or that, that are always given because the examples in my view are relatively limited thank so you very much there. Ron, that is very interesting. And um, I'm going to actually go to Andre, because Andre, I see you nodding there. And I'd like to get your reflections, but I'd also like to ask you all the question, why is this? Um, are companies short of capacity and resources that they're kind of taking, say, somewhat of a boilerplate approach to these key risks, not in, uh, investing enough of their human resources, their analytical capabilities into identifying the risks and opportunities? That's one possibility. But I'm interested, Andre, in, in what, you, what you might say in reflection. Well, in, in direct answer to your first to your question, and then I will uh, go to uh, what Ron said. Um, well, when I look at banks in the Netherlands and also Abel and Emro, um, we're quite busy from the from the risk department perspective with the SFR. So, which means uh, getting data, delivered data, seeing how we can get up with all the mandatory requirements by the end of the year. So, when you look at uh, our risk department, they're very busy with that. Um, looking from a wider perspective um, and also in line with Ron said but I do do totally agree there what he said um, and this is also because of um, I often discussed with within ABNMO and also with clients and other banks uh, the materiality analysis as such and every said we have a materiality analysis which is great with a materiality matrix um, but the, not like a previous said not every materiality matrix is the same what are the questions that define the matrix? Um, in my opinion, most of the matrices are not about um, uh, um, risks and opportunities. They are about topics that could be relevant for a Benemro, are relevant for a stakeholder, but are not always to be considered as a sustainability risk or a risk or, or an opportunity. It's a topic that has to be dealt with, basically. Um, so sometimes I have the discussion with my risk colleagues say we've had a perfect uh, uh, risk matrix. No, it is not a risk matrix because we as a M&M use an IRC matrix and we look at the question asked, it's all about long-term value creation, which is a different perspective than what my risk colleagues have because they have the old-fashioned finance uh, uh, um, perspective, uh, the short, medium term uh, perspective. And it's very hard for people to understand that. It's very hard to get to use to how these things work. Um, and I do see, like uh, like like Ron said, good examples. Very hard to find. Yes, it's it's most of the time the obvious. I know Aiden Emro. When I look at my college, who do do the, the, the actual who make the money? I only burn the money. They they, they make the money. That's from the, from banking perspective. Um, they try to make money with what's there. And if it's easily, Eben yeah, is a big uh, a mortgage provider in the Netherlands. Um, they look into how can I can make a some sort of a pro product to easily um, help our clients with this, but also make money easy, easily, because you can find very complex products, but complex is also not good because then clients most of the time don't understand it. So yes, there is a struggle there. You can see that from from uh, um, from banks and other uh, uh, financial uh, institutions that um, financing change, that's basically what you ask, financing, it's, it's very hard because it doesn't always fit the, the risk models you're used to use. So when you want to do it differently, you have to go to the, 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 the backbone of a bank or a financial institution, which is their risk methodology, and change things there. And this risk methodology is based originally on the IFRS and also on, on years and years and total thousand years of experience basically and that came to some sort of risk modeling now you come up with new topics in my opinion even much more important topics but it has to fit somehow in this old-fashioned risk model and this creates very much friction 
how must we handle this? How can we handle this? You can even see it now, like I said, with the SFR regulation. They really, you know, what, what, why, why do we use these data for? Where is necessary? Why do we have to report this? What will happen with it? That's the kind of question you get not only from banks, but also from our clients. That's very interesting. And you've some interesting insights there on uh, cognitive routines that people are in their business as usual. They've done this a great, you know, with, with you know, very good accuracy, and now they have to change. And, and how do, do they adopt to that? Um, and Nadia, I'd be interested in your reflections, and, and I may even go a little bit deeper and, and see if you can cite some ex good examples yourself of uh, reporting on risks and opportunities. Thanks, Dawn. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a really good question. I I would say, kind of to your earlier question, there is definitely confusion around what good looks like. Um, I do think firms need guidance. I think firms need to start with kind of a simple map of, you know, what are commonly accepted material risks within this the sector that they're operating in. Um, how can they go about considering impact on their business models? I think, as Ron said, people will tend to go for the simpler approach first. I think that's okay. <laughs> like start with a simple approach first, then add complexity to it later. Um, I think also thinking through how they can outperform others in their sector to embrace those opportunities and, and also to tackle common risks. It is an important step forward. I haven't seen that kind of consolidation yet. And so when, when I'm talking about consistency of reporting, we don't see that. And I think all the examples that you gave earlier were great. None of them look like each other at all. Um, so, one of the other places maybe I would highlight, Dawn, is this is a widely acknowledged problem, uh, but there is also a rush to solve this problem by lots of different institutions. Um, and I think that sometimes ends up adding complexity. Many frameworks, many solutions, kind of which one do I turn to? Um, and actually what I've observed happening is the confusion around what good looks like means that companies are going to start to turn to, okay, well, what does regulation require me to do? So you can see, for example, in the UK market, TCFD is mandated for premium listings. You can see in Europe, the build out of the EU taxonomy and the sustainable finance disclosure regulation starting to think through principal adverse indicators. And what you're starting to now see is, do I exercise my own discretion in reporting or do I cater to what's required of me? Uh, and somebody else has done the thinking around what good looks like, what environmentally sustainable looks like, and therefore I can just tailor my metrics to that. Um, in, in terms of your ask on, on an example of good, I'm not going to call upon a specific company. Uh, but one thing actually I would like to draw upon, um, we did a presentation, it was actually in January 2020, so when people were allowed to meet each other at a la large panel event, but it was to disclosing corporates. And the thing that alarmed me most was in the Q&A. And these disclosing corporates basically were asking the panelists, what do I need to show you to ultimately get a e good ESG score? They were so mindful that an ESG score drives investor behavior that they and they were also so mindful that different models give you different results that actually they were starting to cater their information to what they considered to be investor relevant. Um, and so if I could offer anything by way of advice in terms of framing this solution, it's to say, let's start to give some clear examples of what good looks like, some clear guidance, start basic grow upon that basic and, and continue to allow organisations the flexibility for them to continue to define their own risks and opportunities and in, in frameworks as they evolve. Thank you, Nadia. Um, excellent insights from all of you. And what I hear as well from what you said, Nadia, is that this bias creeps in. Yes, you want to involve all your stakeholders um, and make decisions about who your key stakeholders are. What you don't want to do is have stakeholders dictate how you're going to evaluate your risks and opportunities and report on them, particularly certain key stakeholders that you're aiming to attract attention from. Um, so I wanted, Philip, to go to you as well and talk a bit about double materiality and 
indeed we do have a question on this um, asking us um, you know how is Europe going to integrate with other regions and I think we would all have strong views on this when you know an example some regions are not considering double materiality but I'll let you talk about the subject of uh, materiality generally um, Philip and, um, and hear what you have to say thank you Thank you, Dawn. Uh, well, as, as regards the other regions not really reflecting double materi materiality, I would say bad for them and bad for their companies. It's it's a real mistake, and I'll explain why. And, uh, yeah, it's a, there's a lot of ground to cover. But, uh, Andre and Julia actually <laughs> covered a lot of it, so I'll just I'll just keep referring to them. So um, for the double materiality to work, the the risks and, and opportunities need to be provided in the context of the business model. That's 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 just one thing. Everything needs to be integrated. That's the that's the that's the starting point. And the problem in practice is that um, really companies just either use the financial materiality perspective, or whether it's an integrated or not, or the the impact perspective. It's it's rarely you know both. It's rarely you know this kind of in, integrated dynamic perspective that I think analysts actually apply quite. Uh, quite well to refer back to to, to Julia, um, but you know the, the problem is that if the perspectives are disconnected, then the analysis of risks and opportunities of, is really of little use from from actually from either perspective. You know the the financial materiality with regards to sustainability exists because there are impacts. They don't need to be caused by the company; they, they are just linked to the company. Uh, but they are they are they are they are there, and that's, that's what makes uh, it potentially financial material. And vice versa for the for the for the when it comes to the impacts or addressing the most important impacts, I mean that usually requires changes to business model, strategy, and financial model planning. Those are let's say financial material material issues. So there is a way how to bring these uh, things uh, things together. And then Julia made a really really good overview of how these things actually can be applied in 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 practice. And the first is you know just mapping out the the, the context of where this how the strategy of the company meets uh, sustainability. And uh, here is actually a, a point on which I, well, um, I would complement what Nadia said about the, about, let's say, giving flexibility to companies and so on and so forth. There are, I mean, from the double materiality perspective, there are certain objective, uh, objective, let's say, criteria, which need to be clarified to companies or that the companies need to, need to, need to follow. And the current complexity of various reporting initiatives and recommendations are, is not really helpful. So one, one such you know, important point for the context is the, is, the, is the context of the climate transition within the Paris Agreement goals. And it's simply not negotiable. It's not for a company to choose whether which scenario is, is better for the survival of the, of the civilization. It doesn't work like that, even though uh, that's, that's really you know, uh, seen. So this kind of science-based approach to climate transition and clear public standards in that regard are, are really important. The other is, is to clarify how to, how to, how to approach the uh, the stakeholder perspective and the impact side of the double materiality. And the due diligence, the human rights and environmental due diligence is the tool here. And there's an urgent need to clarify the quality principles in this in this regard. And there's something different than you know, doing some kind of a checkbox style standard for what needs to be disclosed there. It's somewhere, let's say, in between. And finally, there in this context, there needs to be the answer to the question, where does company business sit in this with regard to the climate transition, with regard to the to the impacts identified through due diligence? And if this all comes together, then comes where actually Julia's next point. I was laughing as she was speaking because I had the exact uh, same three points. In this context, then we can have a discussion about, right, what are the strategic targets? What are the implications of meeting those strategic targets in terms of the capital allocation planning and so on and so forth? So all of this is actually a pretty simple framework, which can be you know, easily you know, clarified in the legislation in order to simplify it for companies. So of course, the choice of the strategies, that's up for the, for, for the company. So it's, that's, that's you know, the, the way I, uh, how I wanted to complement what Nadia, Nadia, Nadia said. And if I may say one more one more thing, because there was a question on standardized maturity matrix, uh, and I think I was asked to, to respond to that. Well, uh, in terms of the topics, the, the European reporting standards will set certain topics that are quite, that are you know typically understood as material and, and that need to be addressed. But what's more important is is to is to is to is to provide clarity to companies through the standards as to what. You know how the process of, of determination of materiality should should look like. What needs to be considered? What needs to be disclosed? Rather than the form in terms of in, in form of some kind of a matrix. I mean, matrix can be used in an intelligent form, and you can look, for example, how Triodos is using that with respect to to the, to different stakeholders. 
but just you know, just you know, putting some categories in a table that it's not going to result in any, any let's say, useful useful disclosures. Tagging of the information is much more important. Critical information that needs to be disclosed on material topics. The uh, the the criteria for consideration of, uh, of of what is material, what is not, from impact perspective in particular, that's what's needed, and what, that's where the standards can help. In terms of the uh, and that's my last last point. In terms of some good practice examples that we've identified through our work, and actually something that I may suggest to you as well to look into. Mm -hmm. All of those, all of those, all of those good uh, good practice examples combine two things. One is the clarity on the on the let's say context and company's value chain, and connected to that, you know, stakeholders affected and values affected, and so on and so forth. On one hand, on the, on the other hand, clear strategic objectives. Right, so this is a material topic, but the real question is, what is the plan? What are we doing about it? And that needs to be reflected in a strategic objective. And it's very much aligned with Mervyn King's vision of the outcome-oriented corporate governance. He wrote a short piece in Financial Times just yesterday. I encourage people to, uh, to look at it. And so just, you know, look at the reports of the likes of H&M, Ericsson Schneider Electric, which is really good on the opportunities in taxonomy alignment. Triodos, I mentioned, MERS. Caring and its comprehensive way of addressing sustainability objectives and uh, and uh, the value chains. And you know, if there are clear numbers of strategy and targets and value chain descriptions and you know the assets affected, that's it. We don't need you know we don't need to we don't need to ponder on how the maturity metrics should look like. It's all about the information provided, much less about the, the uh, actual form. And companies who did this good, but they did they, who do this well, they do it in front of their report. So you don't have a problem to find it, and everything kind of naturally builds from that. So yeah, it is complicated, but it is not rocket science. It's, uh, and as you can see, actually, people do speak, tend to speak about the same issues. I'm, I'm really helpful, hopeful about the European standards uh, being able to provide some clarity, whilst retaining that flexibility in terms of what company strategies could, uh, could look like. Thank you very much, Philip. Some very interesting insights there as well. And, and still on the topic of materiality, um, Julia, if I could run to you there, um, can you tell us a bit about your process, whether it's more of a process rather than a matrix, um, how you have approached it uh, within NL? And we've lost Julia there, so I'll wait for her to come back. And Andre, I'm going to pass this and topic to you as a preparer, Andre. Thank you. Now you got me off guard. Uh, <laughs> can you repeat the question, please? So, um, on the topic of materiality, how are you as an organization and as a preparer, and, and you know, bearing in mind that you're also a user, how are you determining it? Are you looking at a matrix? Are you looking at process-based? Is dynamic materiality part and parcel of what you're considering? Um, as, a, as, a, as a preparer, um, um, yes, it is dynamic because we do it basically every year, but that's a short up update. Uh, most of the time we do it like um, once every two years, we create a, a big materiality analysis, which is a big, big project. Um, and our materiality process is, is assured. Uh, we've got reasonable assurance. So every step we take is uh, looked into by, by our assurance provider. And we use, uh, we try to use big numbers. Uh, a, a lot of clients, I think two or three thousand clients are asked. A lot of employees, investors, uh, society at large. We have four big stakeholder groups. And why do we use these big numbers? To be quite honest, um, so we have no discussion internally about the results. That's the that's my main answer. Yes, it's very useful also outside, but the results don't change that much if you use uh, five hundred clients or five thousand clients. Uh, but 5,000 5, is very nice to have inside if some, somebody complains about the results. So that's, that's for a start. Um, that being said, materiality is still a very um, difficult topic. Um, you have the financial materiality, which is something different than from, for instance, the RFC materiality. We work for, with the UNIP5 principal responsible banking, which have a different sort of materiality. Human guiding principle for human rights work with salience, which again is a different form of materiality. And all these materialities have 
that give some sort of guidance, but not exactly the same on which topics are relevant or not. So um, again, please give us one uh, one framework we can we can use. Um, um, otherwise, you you get lost in discussions which are quite curious. I mean, uh, if you talk about materiality with someone of our, your financial department, uh, their the definition of materiality is completely different. They and there it's just pure financial. It's within five percent of a certain amount of money. And when it's, it does exceed that, then it's material. And if below that, it's not material. You don't have to take it into account, which is something completely different than we look, for instance, at salience at 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 human rights and the human guiding principle of human rights, which is completely different. It's only about the effect, not about the um, how big it is. If one person in your value chain, which isn't even your client, could be influenced sincerely, uh, then it's relevant. So this difference is so completely <laughs> in in that in the thinking of your know, finance department or your risk department. Well, you almost new, need new people with new brains to. You know to to understand what's really going on, and this is a process that, in my opinion, takes years. Uh, I mean, we started it in 2013. We're eight years later now, and I see some changes. And I think for other companies, it's basically the same. Obviously, banks, you know, very conservative people. Yes, very conservative systems and so on. That doesn't help. But again, it, this does take time if you uh, and let it evolve normally in the way a company works. So legislation is, could be very useful. Normally, a bank doesn't ask for legislation. You only complain about legislation. Uh, but in this case, it's very useful to have legislation to have create a, a level playing field. Thank you, Andre. And it's interesting because you talk again, you know, about the interdisciplinary nature of this. Um, and um, I know we have a couple of questions that I'll come back to all of you on. I want to hear from Julia on this as well. And but one question I just have you think about before Julia talks about materiality is um, how can companies learn from you? You know, you've spent years getting better at reporting and not only, of course, the reporting, but all the actions. And how can other companies leap Frog on what you've done, especially also for startups, you know, for these companies who are availing of opportunities in our decarbonisation, our circular economies. So, um, you know, obviously I'm, I'm staying with some of the questions we have, but as this mixes up, please feel free to dive in. And after um, Julia, I'll, I'll also go to Ron as well to give reflections on that. Thank you. Julia, go ahead. Yes, yes, thank you, Don. It's not an easy question. So I think that uh, I think that we have uh, we will try in our sustainability report and also in our corporate report, reporting framework in general to describe a little bit the process that we follow in order to create a clear scheme of the process. It's normal that not all companies can do the same thing, but I think that all companies can follow the same processes, more or less. So I think that the startup, in, uh, in, if I consider your question, can, uh, can work also with the Dell, for example, because we work with them in order to address our big challenges in terms of energy transition. And when they work with us, normally we um, try also to spread our sustainability information, our sustainability um, process with them in order to contribute to the process and in order to try to disseminate, because I'm totally convinced that uh, we will win all together. So we have to share our processes. So for us, for example, it's not absolutely a problem share our process with other companies. If they want to, to work with us uh, with the, in some activities, it's a, it's a wonderful thing, because we are all part of the same value chain. And so, and so for us, it's, it's important in this way. Um, I think that it's, uh, we have, uh, and I totally agree with, An with Andre, we have different level of maturity. We have uh, many, many details that we use uh, that uh, normally we have to disseminate in a better way. For example, when Andre says that uh, we have different perception of the concept of materiality, it's absolutely true. 
but it's absolutely true that we have to start to consider materiality, I think, in the correct way. Materiality is useful only to report or is useful also for plan. If materiality is important to plan, I think that we have started to weight our stakeholder. And uh, we have also weighting the stakeholder, differentiated the different targets that we have. So I think that we have some information that for a niche is absolutely clear, but we have to create all together, uh, sorry for the word, but a glossary for the mass. And uh, our role is absolutely this one. With the Andre, with the other companies, uh, our role is uh, we have studied, we have worked so hard on this kind of topic for many, many years. So we have to be available to share our experience and to contribute to write uh, the general glossary to, to start to work on sustainability, not only in a niche group, but also in a, in a mass group. And Julia, indeed, and we've prepared a glossary in our report just to mention and to try and deal with that exact challenge. But also, do you have a, a, an answer for those um, reporters who are still on the learning curve, but they have many upstream and downstream risks and opportunities that they have to address and they want to um, speak to their business model and their, their dynamic materiality, their stakeholders about this? You know, where would you, you know, begin in that type of a challenging value chain? Yes, absolutely. So the first of all, uh, it's absolutely important to describe your value chain and to be really clear the different step of the value chain. Seems to be a simple thing, but it's not a simple thing. So you have to describe your value chain and also you have to identify your risk and the opportunities today in uh, the medium term and in the long term. It's absolutely important that you link risk opportunities also to the mega trend that we will have in the future, uh, because uh, you're in not only the list of risk can change, but also the weight of this kind of risk and opportunities could change uh, in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term. Uh, for us, it's absolutely important to create a single framework of risk that we can use in different way if you have a focus on financial, if you have a focus on sustainability, but the list and the framework, it's necessary that it's the same because we will the same uh, uh, structure that, for example, the audit department will verify as a third level. So we have to consider that the company is the only one. So we have to create this kind of framework because it's absolutely important that it's useful also for our board of directors that have to approve all the processes. So sorry, don't know if I repeat this kind of thing, but I think that it's important that we have a systematic view of this kind of process, starting to the knowledge of the value chain. If we work on the value chain, we are an, an integrated, a vertical integrated utility. So we have different phases of the, of, of the value chain. If we don't work integrate, it's a little bit difficult uh, to really identify because we have some risk in a part of the value chain that will become big opportunities in another part of the value chain. I so it's an important method of, the, of this kind of part. So if you say upstream and downstream, it's possible that I have a risk on the upstream that will become an opportunity in the downstream. So this part is really, really important. Okay, so this is really a holistic development of the risks and opportunities across the value chain. And, and that's where we get the uh, different departments speaking to one another. We've good communications and, as you say, the use of a single framework as well um, to streamline, you know, the board, uh, the sign off of these analysis as well um, to reduce administrative burden. And, and, and Ron, I know we're, we're running out of time, but I did want to ask you as well on your reflections on a good reporting of sustainability risks and opportunities in this context um, and perhaps you have some insights from an investor's standpoint that you'd like to share. Uh, thank you, Don. Maybe just to uh, to briefly reflect on this uh, discussion on materiality. Um, we have a lot of discussion with uh, with companies, Dutch listed companies, on their materiality matrix, on how they determine material topics. Uh, on the one hand, uh, of course, the GRI uh, matrix is used a lot, where you have stakeholders providing input, but you also have the access of a company itself assessing the same topics 
regarding either the impact on their company or uh, or some other dimension. Now, if you really ask questions uh, to companies about, okay, how do you now actually uh, assign a, a certain value to a certain topic, then it turns out that that is also not very mathematically uh, determined, um, which of course is also very difficult to do. But there is also within companies discussion, okay, what does a certain axis actually reflect? So if it says the axis gives the impact on company X, and for example, we recently had a discussion on the item green recovery, which was uh, designated to have a low impact on the company, while from, from an outside perspective, we actually thought that it must have major, um, um, major opportunities actually for this specific company but it was still considered to have a low impact. And then we got into the discussion, you know, okay, how do you even determine um, this, uh, this level of impact? So um, this type of discussions, we actually as investors have a lot with companies still. So that in any case shows that there is not a clear way to determine materiality and some additional guidance or standardization in this in that area is absolutely welcome. Um, then if the materiality has been determined and there is a subsequent reporting on a certain issue, then you also, I am, to be honest, quite surprised uh, about the lack of um, of uh, new insights deriving from that. So we have all these new tools to our uh, disposal, such as the TCD recommendations, such as the IRC reporting framework, that sort of try to force companies to critically self-evaluate and to report on this process and on, on potential changes uh, on, on, on in, in the business models that follow from certain, you know, the identification of risk and opportunities to to the to the um, to the business, um, but we hardly see any any real disruptive information on that. So companies are very reluctant to to give to be transparent about the process of change that they might or might not be in. So. Um, um, for example, the TCFD recommendations, if you do a scenario analysis on how climate change affects your company, that might in certain cases lead to, you know, very maybe disturbing insights because it can be disruptive, right? But those reports we don't really find. You only find the outcomes that are that are confirming what companies are already doing. Well, I think the tools that are available to companies have the potential to show that that need need is uh, that, that there is a that is that the change is really required right so there is for investors it's absolutely very difficult to get a closer look under the hood um, just based on the current state and common reporting practices unfortunately Thank you very much. These are incredible insights that you've shared. And um, I will uh, summarize some key points um, after we go to our polling questions. Um, I believe we're ready to have a look at these answers. I'm, I'm looking at them off my mobile phone, sort of a bit minute. Um, our, our fourth question was, um, which of the sustainability risks should companies significantly improve their reporting on? And I can see here um, that really, uh, all, all of them is the dominant answer here at 52% approximately. Um, climate um, comes in quite high at 16% and then biodiversity and human rights. And of course, we couldn't list all of them. I think they all speaks for itself. But we also have social coming in there, well weighted with the others. Um, and then on our next polling question, how can companies significantly improve their reporting on sustainability related opportunities? Um, we're really looking, um, you know, and again, this is one of the more challenging areas. And um, we put forward more suggestions that people could select from. And I see straight away that, um, uh, you know, many people, about a third went for all. Um, and my phone is after switching slides there now, so I'm afraid I'm unable to see the rest of the results. <laughs> Um, Saskia, if you want to say a few words on it there, you're welcome to. Oh, here it comes back now. Um, so all is half um, again. So we're really looking at quite a large proportion um, uh, that are suggesting that, sorry, it's at about 35%. 
um, map the relationships of risks and opportunities. Everyone seems to think there needs to be more connection between them, especially around the value chain, Julia, as, as you discussed. Um, align operations with EU taxonomy. Yes, there's about 13 percent. Um, remembering that the taxonomy do no significant harm criteria um, are, are risk-based, and also the entire adaptation taxonomy is based on a risk assessment approach. Um, so this is very um, relevant to risks and opportunities. Place more emphasis on social related, a small percentage, only 3% say that. Um, and then it seems that um, place more emphasis on, on environmental related opportunities, yes, a little bit bigger, and conduct regular analysis and internal and external stakeholder expectations gets a good 10% or 11%. But really, I think people are telling us across the board all, more of, more of everything, really. And it depends on your business model. And I see all of our guests are nodding there. Um, let me just, in a way, in a couple of words, speak to you about what I've heard. And I know we can't get around to everything. We also can't get around to all the questions on technology. Um, I have to say, ABN AMRO, and this is just to directly answer a question that we got earlier. ABM AMRO have been identified as very high level tech, as has NL, as has FCA and Neste, who use blockchain to analyze their full um, value chain around their products also. And we have many other examples and there are others out there that we won't have identified. But for those of you who ask questions around technology, just to let you know that. And what do we hear on risks and opportunities? Well, strategically, companies need to stand back and look at where they are going in the timeframes that are relevant for their business. And they also need to be braver. Yes, they want to take a high level view around risks and opportunities, but they need to consider what speaks to their business model um, and, and what, you know, when they step out of the fold, what's that saying about them and, and where does that put them and, and be brave about it. Um, and that's really speaking to looking under the hood, Ron, as you mentioned there, and also Andre, again, going to the interrelationships internally. You know, what are we in a routine of doing? Yes, we've been doing it well as a company, but now that we're faced with key challenges from climate, from circular economy, biodiversity, um, all of these environmental and then human rights, employee um, uh, rights as well, et cetera, all of the environmental and social aspects where do we need to start changing our business as usual model? And maybe we need to redesign how we consider risks and opportunities and upskill internally so that people feel that they can speak to one another on a, on a good level and get the most out of their conversations with their specialists and their various departments that, that the company has spent years developing. And, and everyone has the capacity to look at things differently. It takes a bit of time, but where there's a will, there's a way. And, and that's what we're looking for. It's that will in organizations. Um, I know I don't have time to go into more detail. I think you all spoke very eloquently and succinctly about your points. I'm going to hand over to Saskia here to do wrap up and, uh, and finish up. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dawn, for handing over. Well, uh, Mario and Dawn already summarized what we um, what we heard. Uh, I think it was a very uh, good, rich, fruitful discussion. Uh, like some in the chat box says, tons of materials for our project task force. So you've given the audience a lot of work with your questions and also the polling questions have given uh, good input. Um, what I heard a bit myself was uh, really a recognition of the findings from various perspectives, whether you are a preparer, a user, uh, um, or a data provider like uh, like Bloomberg. Uh, and also, I think another general message I got was these sort of encouraging words uh, about what Africa is going or is asked by the Commission to undertake on sustainability reporting standards in Europe. Now, there, there were quite a lot of questions as well. Um, how that would relate to the global initiatives. Well, I want to say uh, in this respect that um, you, from the start of that we were given the mandate, so uh, almost a year ago, it was very much underlined that it was not about reinventing the wheel. It was uh, taking into account what is already there and what is there is notably on the global level. Um, if you 
have read the report of the Project Task Force on Non-Financial Reporting Standards, uh, you will have seen that there is a new word developed. The word is called co-construction. So it means building on and contributing to these uh, international initiatives. And of course, I'm speaking under the supervision of Ron and uh, Julia, who are both in the task force. So international in initiatives are an important part. Also in the report of Jean-Paul Gousses, the Ad Personamandan on the governance and finance, there is a separate chapter on global initiatives. So yes, this is not about Europe doing its own thing. It's Europe contributing to and building on what is already there. Otherwise, we will never be able to meet all these uh, very ambitious deadlines. If you have read the letter that Jean-Paul Gosses was referring to, he mentioned uh, the date that is in the letter of a first set of standards by June 22. So, so far that. Um, I heard that um, actually the project is quite timely and has a good place because there's a lot of work to do. Uh, you mentioned as panelists uh, the words boilerplate quality, missing dynamic focus, pioneering, reporting is a journey, too much a PR tool, often not a KPI but just data. We need a spread process involving all categories of stakeholders. Um, we need more beyond what is already obvious. Um, Clear examples are needed, what good looks like. I think it was Nadia saying that. So we have to define what is actually good. And I think that is really the purpose of this project that the project task force is undertaking. And Philippe was underlining good practice examples combine clarity on context and value chain and strategic objectives. What is the plan? What are we going to do about it? It's complicated. It's not rocket science. I think these are very, very um, valuable words uh, in general to, to summarize uh, what we have heard. So I would like to thank you all, first of all, the audience for being there, for answering to our questions, to putting questions to our speakers. But then, of course, a very big thank to all our speakers, Mario, Dawn, Julia, Philippe, Ron, Nadia and Andre. Without you, it would not have been possible. And we have um, an enormous amount of, uh, like we said, tons of material that contribute to the work. So this is a very good start. What we plan to do is to publish a summary report on this, um, what we have heard today. So you will see that um, I'm not going to put a date on it, but let me put, say, in due course. So I think I'm going to stop there. We have a few minutes more. It's not that much, but I see already that some people have to leave as well. So rest me to say, a very nice afternoon and evening, and we look forward to you in our next opportunity, next webinars, and hopefully you will all read the report when it comes out, which we certainly believe will be before the summer. Thank you all. Thanks, Mario, Don, Julia, Filippo, Nadia and Andre. <laughs>